It's Mr. Jacob Kosule, soon to be doctor, I'm sure, one of these fine days. And um, he serves in Uganda. Uh, he serves as an instructor at Uganda Baptist Theological Seminary, or Uganda Baptist Seminary. And uh, he also uh, is coordinating a local Bible school network. And, uh, and he's also the pastor of a local church. He does about four or five full-time jobs. And uh, so he was the great one to ask to come and talk to us about how you can create kind of a, a multi-stream approach to theological education. Come, brother. It's a good morning. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for who you are. And we praise you for what you've been doing and for the amazing things that we see you do every day. We thank you for Abten and we thank you for this meeting. And God, I pray that this might be the beginning of something beautiful that you've planned for, that you're going to do, that will change not only Africa, but change the world for your glory. And I pray that we will be those faithful instruments that you're going to use to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, I was given this topic, diversified missional theological education. It, it's a mouthful, but at least we are familiar with these words, uh, diversified, which of course just means to have various form or to give a variety of things or to distinguish. And so as we talk about missions and theological training, we, we need to be diverse. We need to have different aspects and different approach to what we do and how we're doing it. And of course, when we say missional, literally, it just has to be mission-oriented. And we were, our brother did a great job yesterday telling us about the mission of God, the fact that God has been on mission from day one, and he calls us to join him on that mission. And so that means as we move forward, we're looking at having a diversified missional theological education. Now, I'm believing some of you are familiar with Samuel Ngewar and Mark Shaw and Tait Tienu, especially their book, Issues in African Christian Theology. I just taught that book uh, a month ago, and as I was reading and studying at the same time preparing for these, it became a very good pull for me to pull different words and ideas and opinions from as I prepared for this. So if you've read that book, there's some things that you're going to see here which are a quote and extract from that book. But, so if we're going to be diversified and if we're going to be missional and theological in our education, we need to understand certain things. We need to understand what we're dealing with and we need to know the kind of people that we are reaching. And so that means we need to first look at a Christian believer in Africa. And, and a believer in Africa struggles with certain things and deals with certain things. And we're going to see that one of the most difficult things with being a Christian in Africa is that we are faced with an ever-changing society. Society is changing, a lot of things are changing, and, and the most difficult thing, however, is that an African believer has to deal with three different worlds. And so every follower of Christ in Africa is stuck with what do I do and how do I fit in this world. And so the first world is, is what we call the world of the Christian faith, right? And this world is represented by the different things that we study from Scripture. So that the moment you confess Christ as Lord and Savior, and I become a believer, and I have a, a congregation that I go to for fellowship, and there are these words that now I get to hear, words like, you're born again, words like, you're justified, words like, you need to be spirit-filled, or words like, you're saved. And so you get to this world as you confess Christ, and 
You have the gospel, you're preaching and living it, and you're being told this is your reality, which it is. So this is your reality, and you're committed to this world, but there's the second world, the African culture. And, and, and in this culture, it's represented, first of all, by the name you bear, right? Uh, in Africa, much time names are given sometimes based on events and circumstances, and, and it's carried, passed along from ancestors sometime. But the name that you have itself is from Africa, it's from culture. Of course, as you read newspapers, as you watch news from the local channels, almost everything that you get to hear and read is what, is what tells you about your culture, tells you about who you are as an African. And in this world, there's a strong commitment as well. There's a strong desire, and, and there's words like tradition, and words like spirits, and words like development, but sometimes you hear poverty and cultural authenticity, and self, which is very strong. And there are times that you get to that point where, well, yeah, you're, you're in this first world, but this is our culture. This is things that we need to do. And let's first leave Jesus alone. Let's deal with culture. And so now this believer already is faced with this too. So he wants to be committed to Christ and, and be faithful as possible but he still has this strong attachment to this world, and they're being told, well, if you abandon your heritage, if you run away from ABCD, then you might be in trouble. And then, now there's that third world, the modern culture, the, which is now presented by the, just, just looking at all of us here in this room, this is not African, right? This is not African wear, and, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but this is not African wear, but the, the kind of food that we eat now, it, it's changing. It's more towards what is modern, and the TV shows that we watch and the movies that we watch, uh, most of you are more familiar with the MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe, and DC Comics, and all of those things, Avengers, and Thanos, and you get to hear those things and watch those things. Those are not African things, right? But, but it's modern, and, and you want to fit in that, because that's trending, that's what's happening. And so, now a believer, a Christian in Africa, is facing this. And of course, as the things are changing, there's this pull from this world, which is also very strong. And we get into the modern tools and we have the technologies and things like Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and Okud and all of those different things, which you also want to stay in that. But as a believer, we've not done something to help them know how do I deal with these three, and, and where do I stand? And so that's one of the biggest challenge that we are facing. And so that means an African crisis is that there's this gap, this yearning gap between the three worlds that, that this person loves. I love being a believer, I love being an African, and I love being in the modern world. But we've not done so much to help Africans understand this three and, and how to deal with that. And therefore there's a search of a theology which bridges this gap between Christ and the culture. So to the first world, which is the Christian faith, that's Christ's culture, and, and that's who we are, that's, that's what you define everything else, but there's a gap. And, and so there's a search for an African evangelical, and I, I just put that in the bracket. Let me put it, a search for an African Baptist theology. A theology that bridges the gap by applying the truth of the world of faith, that is the first world, and the truth of the lordship of Jesus Christ that is taught in the scripture 
and bringing it to the world of the African culture in the modern times. And so as, as we talk about being missional, as we talk about training in diversity, we need to know how to train because as we look at Africa, this is what's happening. This is a reality for a believer in Africa. And we need to get to now that point where we're presenting the truth of the scripture into both of these worlds, the, the African culture and the modern world, and then allow the word of God becomes the filter for that. So how then do we deal with this? Because th this is what we're, what's happening and, and, and it's a reality in Africa. How do we deal with that? And I believe that the answer to that question is in this room. I believe we are the answer to that question of how do we deal with this, of what do we do, we are the answer. And I say we are the answer because we are the one with the torches. Dr. Kevin was talking a while ago here as he was casting the vision and he mentioned that. We've been entrusted with something so precious. All of us in this room represent thousands of people and stand here on behalf of people. But, but God has uniquely called us all here and given us a huge responsibility to be his representative. And I, I like quoting 2 Corinthians 5, but when you read from verse 18 and 19, Paul says, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ and it says and God is making his appeal through you therefore that's why we're imploring you to be reconciled to Christ and we who are here are the answer to that question how do we reach everyone with the truth of the gospel how do we reach everyone in Africa and then get into the rest of the world with the gospel we are the answer and that's because also we are the theological educators in this room. That means if we don't do something, that struggle will continue being a reality and that will continue haunting us. John Mbiti said something that I read, I was like, that's strong. So John said, the Christians in Africa have faith but not a theology. And yesterday we were reminded of another quote that the churches in Africa are a mile wide but only a few inches deep. And when you put those two together, well, this, you could probably say this is debatable, but if this is true, if those two statements are true, then there's something. Then there's a gap, then there's, there's work to be done. And so what do we do? I believe that Every pastor needs training. Every pastor needs training. But you probably recognize this on the left, and you probably recognize the other building, some of you do, but you don't recognize this one. Most of you, because you, you, you probably don't know where I took that one from. Right? Now, we're talking about diversity. We're talking about being missional and we're supposed to be on mission and join God in what he's doing and God is calling a people for himself. He's reaching to them and God has been intentional from day one of creation. And he's calling people and he has called us, given us this unique privilege to join him, be a small part of what he's doing. And I know we've been doing that, but... For a long time, we've been concentrating on offering a doctoral degree and master's degree, which is very good. We need people with doctorates and, and master's degree, and, and I believe all of us here, we need people like you. But this is just, we're just a small fraction of leaders, of pastors, of ministers. And so we know that not everyone can go here. Not everyone can go to Southeastern. Not everyone can go to Midwestern. Not everyone can go to Southern Baptist. Not everyone can go to Oxford or any of those. 
and southwestern. Yes, I, I, I was I was thinking about it. The word was it was coming. Yes, and that's UBS by the way, just a backside of Uganda Baptist Seminary. For those who are wondering, where did I take that one from? It's UBS. But also, not everyone can go to UBS because of the the National Council of Higher Education and the requirement for entry which necessitate that for someone to join any of this institution must have some level of academic requirement. And so that means the people that these two kind of institutions are able to reach are mainly people from urban centers. People who have heard some level of training, who have some resources to be able to go there. The question is, how about that pastor, that local minister, who did not complete P7, who did not complete Senior 4, who do not have the finance, who does not know English and cannot go to any of these? What happens to them? And I put that as a question mark because of that. So, these, I, I took this from Oyam in, in one of our local Bible school. That, that's a classroom, by the way. It's a church, by the way. And this church is 70 years old. That one. It is. Could it be? So it's, it's this effective without talking about this, this downer school. Let me put it quote in quote. But is this effective? Are we being effective but the training that we're offering, knowing that the kind of people that we have coming in are the elite, literally. Those who have already had some level of training. Are we reaching everyone? Or at least are we reaching the majority that we need to reach? And so that, that, that makes me ask a question then. And the question is, could it be that this type of training has left a gap between the urban leaders and the rural leaders. Because those who are able to come to our seminaries are those who can afford, those who have already heard some learning and, and know how to read and write and have meet the academic requirement to enter into our institution. How about those ones? Could it be that we have created a gap, and the majority are not being reached. And so if that assumption is true, if my assumption that this kind of training has created a gap between the elite, the, the urban ministers, and the rural ministers, how many rural pastors have we ignored? I was reading on the, the, just the website of KBGC, and, and according to that publication, they say at least they believe just within Kenya alone there are 3,000 Baptist ministers. But then the, the shocking thing from that says, but only 300 of those 3,000 ministers have been trained. That is 10%. So if 300 are trained, how about... 2,700 of the ministers. They're not. But they have congregations. They have people who come every week to hear them preached. And the question is, if they're not trained, what are they preaching? So can we say that they're Baptists if they don't know who Baptists are? Can we say they are Baptists if they've not been trained and equipped to handle the word of truth correctly? Can we say our Baptist churches are multiplying and flourishing if they're not people of the book? Because I know Baptists, we, we've been known for a long time as people of the book. And I, I think for a long time now, that has only remained as a title because we have thousands of our ministers who are not trained and they don't know what is even in the Bible. Some of them don't know what the Bible says completely. And so because of the kind of training and the gap that we have, 
created, it has created this. This, this academic theology, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit, versus the popular theology. And I put it in the equation for a reason. You know, so, Tait Tienu says, academic theology is a theology written for international readership. And unfortunately, he also says, it's not embraced that much in Africa. And so, see, we... All of us here are theologians, and, and we've, most of us have written and read, and, and as we're reading, of course, we're transformed, we're changed, and when we stand to teach and preach and speak, it's from that informed decision, because we know the value we've studied, we've learned. Now, the books we read and, and what is important to us as scholars and theologians is not important to that minister in the rural village, was not hard training because it does not even know it's important, right? And so we can stand and teach and preach truth grounded in the Bible, but they're not doing that. And so what are they preaching? They're preaching what is popular. They're preaching what is trending. So what they hear, what they see, what everyone else is doing. And, and who are the everyone else? They are the fellow ministers who have also not been trained and have copied from another minister who has not been trained, who copied from the other one. And so there's this gap of those who know the truth are leaving it and those who don't know and are only following what is trending. And that's, I believe also that's why the prosperity preaching and the false teaching is becoming more and more prevalent in Africa because most of our ministers are not trained. And as these people come, of course, the prosperity preachers and the false teachers have their way of communication and they know how to get to radio stations and television stations. And so they're in our homes, in, in the members' homes, in, of course, in the hands and TVs, and so that's what they see, and that's what they hear, and that's what they copy and pass into the congregation. So that's what's counting. That that that's what you hear in the songs that is being sung, and that's what you 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 feel as he's preaching. The kind of counsel that is given. It's becoming. It's sadly that even in the Baptist churches, some of our Baptist churches, uh, we're beginning to hear the preach, the, 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 the sow a seed and claim it and grab it and push, you know, and pray until something happens. You know that? It's sad. It's, it's now getting into our Baptist churches. What happened to us being people of the book? Well, one of my members went into the village to visit relatives and, and someone who was there preaching used, abused the word so much. And of course, he wanted to get his way into the pockets of the people who had come. And, and he says, quoting the Bible, of course, says in the Old Testament that the act of the covenant, that that box was just not an empty box. Right? There was something inside. And so it, whenever you saw the box, the covenant box, you saw God, you saw something that, that that box represented. And then you say, we ministers today are that box. And so whenever you see the box in front of you, make sure he does not leave empty. Because if he leaves empty, you have the curse of God. And so as I come as the box, I come empty so that I can be filled. Hallelujah. And of course, those, those who didn't know were beginning to move and, and make sure the box was not empty, did not go back empty and emptying their wallet. And this member was sudden because they realized that's not true, that that's a lie. But the people there could not tell it's a lie because they have not been exposed to the truth of the word of God. And this situation is alarming because popular theology is by no means always grounded in and governed by the Scripture. 
And one of the third thing is, sometimes the, the counsels that the pastors give and the way they preach, sometimes it's totally opposed to the scriptural interpretation of the word. What then? That, that, that's, that's the reality of what we are facing here in Africa. So what happened? What then? What, what do we do? Where do we go from here? And I believe the answer is here also. We, we've seen, so, so that, that third building, the one you saw, that nice looking building, I believe this is important too. We, we need to be having those who are going to the seminaries and doing bachelors and masters and doctorate so that they can help prepare those who can continue doing the local Bible schools. Because we've already seen that those who are able to come to the seminaries, just a small fraction of people, majority of our ministers cannot come to the seminary. And, and if we're going to be missional enough and intentional enough and, and doing what God has called us to do, one, in being disciple makers and multiplying and duplicating what God has given to us, then we need to be intentional and make sure every single minister, not only in Africa, and I hope all over the world, is trained. That's the only way. And I believe the only way we will be able to change not just our continent, Africa, but change the world is by having every single minister trained. Whether they have the academic requirement or not, but giving them the truth of the Word of God. Because believe me, if you can train one person, and this person goes back to his congregation and is now able to preach the truth and stand on the authority of the word of God. And the first thing he asks is, what does the Bible say? Believe me, you've changed that congregation. And when that congregation is changed, you've changed that community. And when that community is changed, you're already changing that nation. One person at a time. And we need that. That that should be our focus as we go forward from here. Let's not neglect this. I believe that doing the local Bible school programs can help bridge the gap. We need the seminaries to continue. We need people to continue from the, their bachelor and go to the master's and go to the doctorate. But we also need to reach to those who may never be able to go to the seminary, even if they wanted to. Because they don't know the language, they don't have the resources, or they don't have the academic requirement. But they're serving. We need to help equip them. And of course, the program that, that you'd have will have to be simplified enough to be understandable by the local pastors and leaders. And sometimes you could even do that in the local language, in the vernacular. We've done that in our Bible school. I'm going to share it in a bit. You can have it in the local language and make it contextual enough that this pastor, as he's reading, you might not have to give him all those big hermeneutical terms, but help him know how to study systematically and interpret the Scripture. You know, one of the things that as I teach and travel in different places, especially in Uganda, and, and it's becoming more and more probably African, is that the, the first question we ask is not what does the Bible say? The first question is what does our culture say? And because of that, many of us have gotten to already to doing what this, I have what I want to do, and then just go now to the scripture and look at which portions of scripture can I manipulate to support what I want to do and want to say. And we need to change that around. And as we train people, we'll help them see that's not the approach. It should be I go to the scripture and ask what does God say about what I want to do. And then when God informs my decision and my learning, then what I will do will be for his glory. So the reason why we've taken God's glory is because 
we we it's become about us and i just look for what scripture from god's word can i use to support me and what i'm doing and at the end is i did it and we need to change it the other way around when we begin with god we'll be able to say god did it because we will be able to see god involved from the beginning through the process to the end of it and that should be our goal, that we want to see God honored, not at the end, but even in the beginning, even the process that God is involved all through. That's the God that we serve. That's the mission of God. We're called us to join Him. He is involved in all of that. So we need to provide pastors at the grassroots with a proper approach to biblical interpretation in Africa. Help them understand. In some, some places in Africa, if you read like Isaiah 118, when God says, come let us reason together, and even though your sins were as red as crimson or scarlet, somebody says, I'll make you as white as snow, they don't know snow. Because we hardly see rain in some of our places. So when you're preaching and then you say snow, they're like, well, what's snow? You need to make sure they understand what that means. And sometimes that might mean looking for the, the most whitest thing that they know and make a comparison. So when God says snow, snow is something like this, and, and this is, it, it, you could use it like this. They don't. And sometimes there's been that gap where I'm preaching to people and, and sometimes you'll just see, oh. it's not, sometimes it's not because they're hungry or tired, but because they're not connecting. Teach them, even if it means in their local language. And by the way, that, when you speak their heart language, that transforms them more than you'll ever know. You know, sometimes people say, well, you see, the reason why we cannot do this, it, uh, they don't know English. Well, the reason for the local Bible school is not to go teach them in English, it's to reach them in their place in ways that they understand. If, and if the only way they can understand is in their local language, teach them in the local language. Because at the end of it all is... Which language were you taught in? At the end is, have you been equipped and prepared in the word of God to be able to go and preach it boldly with confidence and content for the faith? And we need to do that. Because at the end, when they go into their community, they don't start and preach in English. It's preaching in their vernacular, in their local language. And we need to do that. And secondly, the simplest village evangelist need to understand how to interpret the Bible rightly in context. You know, we've, people, people, it's so easy to abuse the scripture and it's easy to make the scripture say anything you want it to say if you're not reading it in context. Like when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, just verse 1, just verse 1 alone, Paul says, of course, for the matter of which you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Well, now, how many of you are married here in this room? The Bible says it's good for man not to marry. Why did you marry? You're disobeying him. You need to repent and leave that woman. The, now you can say anything. But then again, if you just pull verse 2 and don't read verse 1 and don't read verse 3 and go down, verse 2 says, but because of the immorality and all that, it's good for every man to have his wife and every woman her husband. Those of you who are married, why are you disobeying God? You must repent now. Sister, since you're not married, I, brother, you might know, perhaps right now the Bible says you must have a husband. Hallelujah. And now it says anything. And that's what's happening in some of our village churches, in our Baptist churches. Because they don't know scripture, they don't understand reading and preaching in context, they'll just pull the verse and then let it say anything. And we need to help them. Because we need to change everyone right from here 
and build that into even those who have the doctoral degree. We need to be in the stone-removing business. You probably heard this. I don't even still remember that. Well, the good thing is, so some of you are like, you mean you came here and you had not prepared his presentation? Because this, you heard this yesterday, right? It's like, no, well, I'd prepared this some time back. Uh, John, Dr. Ewan and I have been friends for some good time. He's actually been my thesis uh, professor and one of my professors from Southeastern. And, and I know his passion and his heart. And, and that's why he mentioned that even yesterday. And that's why I was able to quote him. And if you remember what he said yesterday as he preached from Ezekiel and Isaiah, in, but then mentioned Nehemiah, see, as these people were returning, of course, again, I, I'm, I'm not repeating your sermon, Dr. Ewart, but as these people were returning, you know, you remember that the city was destroyed and, and the roads are blocked. And those who were returned first, God gave them the task. You remove the stones, make the path clear so that those who have not yet come can come in and join you. And we are supposed to do that. We've, we are here. We've been equipped. We have the tools. But there are obstacles. There are stones all over that's making those village pastors and leaders not to get the training that they need. And we need to remove those stones. And one, it is they cannot come to seminary probably because of finance, but mainly because they don't meet the academic requirement. So what can we do to remove that off the way so that they get the training? We need to do that. And I want to tell you about what we do just, just briefly in passing as, as we get to winding up. Uh, as East African Outreach, we, our purpose is to provide theological training for pastors and leaders throughout East Africa by offering a systematic foundational course to equip and establish Christian leadership even in the remotest part of the continent. I mentioned East Africa because we want to begin with Jerusalem. And, and we've, we've done a lot in Uganda. We've now crossed to Kenya. Well, right now, we're, we've, we've just been, uh, we're in Kitale on the other side near the Swan border and uh, just a bit inside. Hopefully, we'll be able to work more with, with our Kenyan friends and hopefully get into Tanzania and maybe even Nigeria, uh, something bad. That, that's our goal. That's what we want to do. And we want to work with our Baptist associations. Normally, that's our contact. Unless we go to places where there are no Baptists, but then we encourage others who are there. And we've seen that happen. There are times we've gone to a zone that is just Pentecostal, and at the end of the training, they're like, can we start a church and call it Baptist Church? They're like, please, hallelujah. Please do that. We've seen that happen. And God has been faithful. God has been gracious. But the, the reason why we're intentional in doing the Bible school is it connected to how we all be, this began. In 2008, our, our, fun, our founder, Terry Nestor, some of you heard about him, uh, was doing a conference. We're in Mbali, just more closer here. And this was a pastor's conference. And so, just as he was teaching and preaching, then he asked a question, very simple question, how many books are in the Bible? Well, I, I hope we know that. But none of these pastors could answer that. And he first thought, he's the one who was translating him did not do a good job. He's like, are you sure you're asking the question I'm telling you? He's like, yeah. Ask again, how many books are in the Bible? No one could answer. And then, Certain after a while, one youth pastor stood and says, there are 69 books in the Bible. He's like, are you sure? He said, yes, pastor, there are 69 books in the Bible. The pastor could not tell how many books were in the Bible. And after learning, she just gathered 17. All of these were pastors. And this was, this was one of the shock. One of those pastors so, so this was May of 2008, but one of those pastors had gotten saved in September of 2007, and now he's a pastor. Barely a year in salvation. Not discipled, and he's pastoring. That's when we saw 
That was a big gap. And, and that we wanted to do something about that. And we've been trying to do something about that. Our, our course, what we offer, is a very, just very simple, very basic, but, but doing our best to give to them something that they, that they need that can help them. Of course, the pastor ministry and uh, doctrine and practice, you can just see those leads. It's just simple surveys, but foundational enough to help equip them and give them something solid so that even if they don't ever get to continue, they're equipped enough to do that. It's a 300 hours of, uh, of lecture in total. I don't know how, much, uh, how well I'm doing with time. I'm, I'm about to wind up. I'm okay? So, our classes meet. Now, this, this is why it's doable. This is why your seminaries can do that, why your churches could do that. For those of you who are here, we, our classes meet only one week a month, Monday through Friday. But, of course, intensive from 8 in the morning to 5 in the evening every day for that week, one week a month for 10 months. And the 11th month, those who have completed that, that list of courses and completed all the requirements, we graduate them. It's, it's doable. Just one week. And you, you might, in your setting, you might need to probably meet, even if it's just three days a week for that time. It might take longer, but you're training them, you're reaching them. Because the goal is we need to be intentional and help our local pastors and leaders get somewhere. And our Bible school program is continuing to meet real need through, throughout East Africa. As we go, we're shocked at what we find out. A lot of times that we've gone and as we begin teaching, you, you find people looking at their Bible like this. Did you give us new Bibles? Like, no. Like, you mean all of this has been here all this while, and we didn't know it? Like, yes. Because for a long time, some of them don't, we've actually discovered that pastors don't have Bibles. We went to a place, and in the entire village, there, there were like 10 pastors, and all they had one Bible, and they share among each other. And so when you need it, then you come and get it from me. And then, of course, while you're gone, I don't have a Bible. And I have to preach from memory and quote whatever I heard and read. And so they don't, they don't spend time reading and studying the Word. And we, it's, it's time we've gone to places. It's becoming more and more prevalent and, and especially clear that people need training. That our churches can only be strong as their leaders are. Our churches will only stand if their leaders are standing. And the leaders can only stand if they're built on a solid foundation. And for them to be built on that foundation, they need the training. So, to now, up to now, this, we've, we've been able to open at least 121 local Bible schools from the time we began in 2008. And we've been able to graduate, just the last graduation we had uh, a month ago brought our total to 1,200 pastors and leaders trained. But that's, that's just a small fraction if you look at the population of Africa. Just a small fraction. And, and that's why I'm appealing to each one of us here, wherever we are, that we can do this. That as we send those who qualify to the seminaries, let's do something for those who don't qualify and don't leave them behind and help them. Just, just a brief picture. Uh, that was just church giving a charge to the graduate. That's just a class. You can see it's as local as, as possible. And th that's, by the way, it's in the refugee camp. That was in BDBD camp uh, in West Nile and... This graduate out there was praying and, and, and commissioning the graduates to you know, be faithful in preaching and teaching of the word. But now, how can seminaries help? So what can seminaries do? Right? This is a question that we are now getting to. Maybe that. Can seminaries partner with the local Bible school programs. And, and I, when I say with us, 
I'm, I'm, I hope I'm speaking on behalf of other uh, pastor training centers and Bible school programs that are spread, hopefully, across Africa. And, and you, you read and probably know what happened in Rwanda, which is something that is beginning to sweep across Africa, that if you're not trained, you don't have a theological background, you cannot lead a church, right? And so as we do this training, we, we also need pastors who, who have been trained, but hopefully with paper from a recognized institution. So could it be possible that we can partner with people or maybe affiliation? Is it possible? Just throwing those things to us, seminary principals and leaders and deans. Or could you help with the accreditation process? God bless you.